Okay, well, in this screencast I want to go through the Excel calculations that we did in tutorial 8. So first of all, we're going to calculate uh, delta E plus and delta E minus, which are the energies associated with the bonding solution and the anti-bonding solution for the hydrogen 2 plus molecule. So first of all, let's go through these calculations using the expressions for the J, K and S integrals that are given in the tutorial notes. So let's go through this calculation. Well, let's actually not start at R equals 0 because it's not going to be a useful calculation. Let's do R equals 0 0.1 here. So let's calculate the exponential of minus r, like so. And then we can calculate s, which you will recall from the tutorial notes, is equal to the exponential of minus r times 1 plus r plus r squared over 3. We can then calculate the exponential of minus 2r. Well, because we have already calculated the exponential of minus r, this is most easily and most efficiently done simply by taking the square of e to the minus r, like so. The j integral is equal to the exponential of minus 2r times 1 plus 1 over whoops, over r, like so. The k integral is uh, can be expressed in terms of the s integral. First of all, it's equal to s over r minus the exponential of minus r times 1 plus r, like so. Then we're going to calculate j plus k and j minus k, because you remember from the expressions for the energies, um, they are needed in that calculation. So let's just make this equal to j plus k, and then this equal to j minus k. Right, then the energy of the bonding solution, the E plus, you remember was equal to minus a half plus J plus K over 1 plus S. Well, we're going to ignore the minus a half. We're just going to be interested in the change of energy from the dissociation energy, the delta E plus. And this is equal to simply J plus K all over 1 plus S like so, and the delta E minus was equal to J minus K all over 1 minus S, like so. Right, if I highlight cells B3 all the way through to J3, and then if I double click on the square in the bottom right hand corner, I will also complete for all the possible values of R like so. On the right here we can see the potential energy curves for the bonding solution in green which is a very familiar potential energy curve for a diatomic system and we've also got in blue here the potential energy curve for the anti-bonding solution and this is everywhere repulsive. If I try to put the molecule into this anti-bonding state then it would want to minimize its energy and it would do that by increasing its internuclear separation. In essence, it would do it by making sure the separation was essentially infinite, i.e. it does not want to bond at all. Okay, well, the purpose of this tutorial wasn't really just to show you what the potential energy curves would look like, but instead to use a far more efficient way of minimizing the potential energy of a system using the newton raphson method. So what we're going to go and do now is have a look at the setup we got in the next worksheet here and we are going to determine 
uh, using the newton raphson method, the equilibrium bond length, and from the equilibrium bond length we will determine the curvature at that bond length, and thus determine the equilibrium vibrational frequency, the dissociation energy, and of course the bond length itself. Right, well, with the newton raphson method, as we discussed in class, one needs to have a guess, an initial guess, for the bond length. Now the system we've got is in atomic units, and the atomic units of length are bore. If we briefly return to the previous worksheet, then of course you can see here that the minimum energy is occurring at roughly two and a half bore. I'm not going to choose that because that's a little bit of a cheat. I'm going to show how we can work this out using the newton raphson method, and we'll start off from a position a long way away from the, uh, the equilibrium bond length. We'll start off, say, at one bore, and you can see that the, uh, the potential energy, the electronic potential energy, at that kind of internuclear separation is indeed a long way away from the uh, equilibrium geometry at around about 2.5 bore. So returning to the, uh, the other worksheet, in cell D2, I can make this equal to 1. Okay, um, for this system, uh, my delta R is going to be equal to 1 times 10 to the minus 6. So I'm going to calculate the energy for separation of 1 bore, and then the energy for separation of 1 plus delta R, and 1 minus delta R. So let's go through the same kind of calculation as we did before. So here we will calculate the exponential of minus R, like so. We'll calculate what S was, which we'll remember is e to the minus R times 1 plus R plus R squared over 3. We'll calculate the exponential of minus 2R by taking the square of the exponential of minus r. We will calculate j, which you'll remember was e to the minus 2r times 1 plus 1 over r. Like so, the k integral was equal to s divided by r minus e to the minus r times 1 plus r, like so. The energy we're going to calculate is of course going to be for the bonding system, the bonding molecular system, uh, the bonding solution that is, and that is just going to be equal to j plus k all over 1 plus S. I'm going to ignore the minus a half term as it's a constant. It's not going to affect our calculations in any way because we're only going to be interested in the differentials of uh, our potential energy curve in order to determine what is, uh, in order to minimize our system. If I now go to uh, cell D3, and in cell D3 I'm going to put in the value of r plus delta r, which is going to be equal to d2, which you set to be equal to 1, plus delta r, which is b1. And I'm going to protect b1 like so, so that when we auto-complete, this cell does not change. I also need to calculate the value of the energy at r minus delta r. So r minus delta r is equal to d2 minus b1, which we'll protect again like so. Okay, we can then copy, or rather we can highlight cells E2 all the way through to J2, and then we can also complete for the other two energy calculations like so. So, in column J here, I have now cal calculated the energy at R equals 1 bore. I've calculated the energy at 1 plus delta R, or 1 plus 1 times 10 to the minus 6 bore, and also at the energy at 1 minus 1 times 10 to the minus 6 bore. 
with these expressions I can now calculate the gradient of the energy around one bore and also the curvature of the energy around one bore. Let's do that. So this will be equal to J3, the energy at R plus delta R, minus J4, the energy at R minus delta R, all over 2 times delta R, like so. So this is the numerical differential of our energy at R equals 1 bore. We can calculate the curvature using the expression that we showed in the tutorial itself. It's going to be equal to the energy at R plus delta R minus 2 times the energy at R plus the energy at R minus delta R all over delta R squared, like so. With these calculations of the gradient and the second differential of the energy with respect to R, I can now calculate the change in our guess for the bond length, for the equilibrium bond length, that will bring us closer to the true equilibrium bond length in class that we gave this the symbol H. And this is simply equal to minus the gradient all over the second order differential. So this is telling me that the newton raphson method wants to increase the bond length by 0.373 to get a better estimate of what the equilibrium bond length would be when the energy is minimized. So we can update the bond length that we initially guessed using this value of h. It's simply going to be equal to our initial guess in d2 plus the amount that we have to increase it by given in m4. Right, now I need to calculate the energy at this value, this updated value for the bond length, and then I also need to calculate the energy at this value plus or minus delta R. So let's highlight cells E4 to J4 and use their formula to auto-complete and calculate thus the energy at R is equal to 1.373 bore, like so. If I now highlight cells D3 all the way through to M4, like so, and I take a copy of this, so control C, and then paste this into cell D6, like so. Here's, I failed to protect cell B1 here, so let's go back and do that. Okay, I'll take a copy of this again, and paste it into D6, like so. Right, so that's now worked. I've now got another improvement suggested on our, on our new guess of the bond length here and it's telling me that I need to improve this new guess by a further 0 0.408 to get closer to the equilibrium bond length. Now I've got enough information to copy these three rows, the information in these three rows to iteratively improve our estimate for the bond length. So I'm going to take a copy of these three rows, go to the next cell, paste them in, one after the other, like so. And each time I'm improving our estimate for the bond length until after the eighth guess, we are pretty much exactly have our solution. Let me just go through what we've, uh, what we've learned here. After the first trial guess, the newton raphson method suggested increasing our original guess by 0.373. After the second guess, it said increase it by 0 0.408, then increase it again by 0 0.371, and then increase it by 0 0.245. And then all of a sudden it started to increase by a much smaller amount, this time 0 0.0863, and then 0 0.00879, and now increase by only 9 times 10 to the minus 5, and then increasing by around about 6 times 10 to the minus 8 and then we pretty much reach the floating point accuracy of XL. Ultimately we have 
virtually a perfect solution. So after eight iterative attempts, we have found our solution. We have identified the bond length here, the equilibrium bond length. And you can see what's happened to the gradient as we've gone through this iterative method. The gradient has got smaller and smaller and smaller until it's essentially zero, which of course is what we would expect at the minimum of the potential energy curve. And in column L, we have identified what the curvature is at the bottom of the potential energy well. And you'll remember from the lectures that this curvature, the second order differential of the energy with respect to the bond length, is the force constant. The only problem is we've calculated this force constant in atomic units and we need to convert to SI units. Let's do this down in cell E31 here. So it's going to be equal to, the force constant will be equal to this value multiplied by this conversion from the atomic unit of energy, which is heart tree, into joules, divided through by the atomic unit of length, which is a bore, squared. And that gives us a value of roughly 98 newtons per meter. And with this, we can now calculate the vibrational frequency in hertz. It's simply going to be equal to the force constant divided by the reduced mass, that's the square root of that, all divided through by 2 times pi. And we can convert that frequency in hertz to wave numbers by simply div dividing through by the speed of light in centimeters per second. The bond length here can be identified from cell D 26. So let's convert that from bore into meters. So d26 times our conversion here. And that gives us a value of 1.32 times 10 to the minus 10. 1.32 angstroms, in other words. d0 can be calculated because the change in energy that we're getting in this column here is the difference in energy from the dissociation limit down to the bottom of the potential energy well. Well, dissociation energies are normally positive numbers. We normally go in the opposite direction. So I need to take the minus of this value. So let's take the minus of this dissociation energy here. Okay, I'm going to put this in brackets. And I'm going to need to convert that, of course, into joules. So let's multiply that by this value here. Now, of course, that's from the bottom of the potential energy well. It's not going to be what's observed. What's observed is the dissociation from the V equals zero state. So we need to take away the vibrational zero point energy, which is going to be approximately equal to H nu over two. So let's take away h times nu in hertz divided by 2, like so. Now, we also want to express this in terms of, uh, in, in, in units of kilojoules per mole. So I need to uh, multiply the, the sum of these two things by Avogadro's number and then divide through by 1,000. Okay, so multiplying by Avogadro's number converts it to per mole, and dividing through by 1,000 converts it into kilojoules. Okay, so the dissociation energy from the V equals zero state is thus going to be equal to roughly 181 kilojoules per mole. Thanks for listening.